everybody. Glad that you have joined us for tonight's uh, really great opportunity to uh, talk with one of the one of the legends in biblical studies. We uh, tonight we're back in the BCM office after uh, the last few webinars. Uh, we were broadcasting from Ojai Valley Community Church. Now we're back in our uh, little office. Norman is in Oakland. Uh, he is at the house of David and Susan Fecho, and we are very, very grateful that they are hosting the connection for Norman to um, be part of this. So thanks, David and Susan. And also, I think Laura Gottwald, uh, Norman's partner, is standing by there in the room. Just a reminder that uh, half of the proceeds for tonight's webinar will be going to the Center and the Library for the Bible and Social Justice, about which you'll hear more uh, toward the end of the webinar. Uh, Norman, as for you, we're going to pay you in peaches. Uh, these are the peaches that are uh, coming in right now on our trees here in the yard in Oakview. And uh, well, one of these days, we'll get you a beautiful, juicy peach. I love them. Thank you, Chad. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. As uh, all of our participants uh, are aware, this webinar uh, was supposed to be with both Norman and Jack Elliott. Um, Jack is a Lutheran minister and a uh, retired New Testament professor from the University of San Francisco. Um, unfortunately, late last week, um, Jack's dearest friend, uh, indeed the man who hired him uh, to begin his long tenure at USF, unexpectedly passed. And Jack called on Friday to say that he was pretty broken up about that and that the memorial service had been set for tonight at this very hour. So as we're doing this uh, webinar, Jack is um, preaching at the memorial service of a dear friend. So our prayers go out to Jack, uh, who's uh, pictured here. Um, we are sorry that we won't get the chance to talk with Jack um, about his equally interesting uh, career as a scholar concerned with social issues. Um, nor will we get to uh, discuss his groundbreaking work on First Peter, which you see pictured here, <clears throat> which um, analogously to Norm's work uh, had quite an impact on the field of New Testament studies uh, in terms of persuading people of the power uh, and utility of using social science criticism of the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> we do, however, have with us tonight Norman Gottwald, by any account, the dean of um, biblical scholars uh, who have embodied the social scientific methodology, uh, liberation hermeneutics, and commitment to engage social movements. So uh, Norm, welcome to you. Uh, before we start the interview, uh, I want to take a moment of personal privilege to uh, make a little tribute to you, Norm, as our teacher, our mentor, and our elder. I'm repeating here some of what I was able to say to Norman uh, a few years ago at the American Baptist Seminary of the West in Berkeley. Um, my first memory of Norman is from the late 1970s. At the time, I was a senior at uh, University of California at Berkeley. I uh, wasn't even yet enrolled in the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, I was, however, involved in an intentional Christian community in West Berkeley. We were committed to faith and social justice activism. <clears throat> then we heard that uh, this famous radical Hebrew Bible professor and theologian was giving a guest lecture to a class up at the Graduate Theological Union. And so several of us from our community trooped up across town uh, and snuck into the lecture. <clears throat> uh, Norman welcomed us the same as he would a student or a professor. Um, not only did he not bust us, but he warmly welcomed us. Uh, I recall him freely passing out drafts of his uh, the work that was to become Tribes of Yahweh to participants in that seminar with not a shred of proprietary concern. As a young skeptic of Ivory Tower academia, I thought to myself, this is different. This is a people's scholar. And that initial impression really stayed with me and influenced me deeply. Um, I want to uh, turn your attention, um, participants, to the notes 
page now up at the top of the screen, there are two resources there. One is an article in which Norman himself reflects on his greatest work. Um, that's available online at the URL there. And then there's also an uh, hour-long lecture by Norman that's available online, uh, the Herod Lectures from Vanderbilt University. Um, in an influential collection of essays that Norman edited around this same time that we were sneaking into the lecture, uh, these concerned the new field of the sociological study of scripture, political hermeneutics, liberation theology. And in this book called The Bible and Liberation, Norman laid out his critique of establishment biblical studies. And this is a quote from the introduction to that book. We, w we must make a fundamental effort to interconnect aspects of Bible study that have been split apart and treated as unrelated, even antagonistic, in academia and the churches. Yawning chasms presently separate thought and practice, biblical academics and popular Bible study, religion and the rest of life, and the past as dead history, and the present as real life. Now. In 1979, as a young student of the, New, of the New Testament, this resonated so deeply with me that the task of trying to bridge these chasms became virtually marching orders for me, despite the fact that I would never formally get to study under Professor Gottwald. Instead, he became my mentor at a distance. In the mid-1980s, having completed uh, <clears throat> we got people coming in. Uh, having completed um, my theological studies, I was laboring to complete a book on Mark, trying to be faithful to the imperatives that I'd seen and heard from Norman. It was at this point that Norman Gottwald played the key role in what would become the turning point in my life. Though he had scarcely met me, Norman received me into his apartment in New York City one rainy spring evening to discuss the manuscript that I'd sent to him. This was 1985. I'd not been able to get the attention of any other New Testament scholar, but Norman Gottwald not only read my manuscript, he went over it with me in great detail, gave me enthusiastic feedback, and then became an advocate for its publication at Orbis Books. I think it's fair to say that uh, had it not been for Norman's advocacy, uh, Binding the Strong Man may well never have uh, seen the light of day. And for that, I continue to be deeply grateful, Norman, to you. So uh, in the old ways of Israel, we read that ancient trees were considered sacred. Abraham and Gideon and Elijah all met God under their venerable branches here in California. The sacred tree is the oak. It rains down acorns, gives shelter to seedlings, and stands strong though not unscarred through all the storms, wildfires, and dry spells brought by the turning of years. As the prophet Isaiah put it once, like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. Traditionally, the elders of a community would sit under these old trees, giving counsel, settling disputes, keeping ceremony. Indeed, our elders are themselves like oak trees, sowing seeds of new life, nurturing the young, sentinels who refuse to yield to the seductions, distractions, and withering violence of life under empire. Norman Gottwald, who you see here tonight, is this kind of oak of an elder. His skin is as thick as oak bark. His leaves often are prickly. He has a reach that defies gravity. He provides cover for whoever would sit under his branches. He is a kind of axis mundi in our lives, offering communion with both heaven and earth. Norm is kind and conscientious, committed and passionate, and strives to embody his th theology and his politics. Frankly, those are not qualities I have very often found among the scholarly guild. So I want to conclude this tribute 
by putting things very plainly. I think I speak for innumerable persons, not only here in North America, but around the world, when I say that I would not be here, we would not be here tonight, were it not for Norman's work and witness. And so it is up to us, as Ezekiel once put it, to become transplanted twigs from the graceful branches of our elders and teachers to one day bear the same kind of fruit and offer the same kind of hospitality as they have for so many decades to all of those seeking respite from the imperial storms. Norman, you have been a tether to the faithful task of biblical study. You have been a lifeline in the desert of academia. You have been a friend on the journey of discipleship. Thanks for it all and a very warm welcome to you to tonight's webinar. My pleasure. It's a great delight to be here. I'm not sure I recognize the person you described, but you're more convincing in that role than most other people who introduced me. Well, we're just delighted to have you on tonight and to um, <clears throat> give some of the folks who are on tonight a chance to get to know you better and for many of the folks probably the chance to uh, meet you for the first time. So we're going to try to give a little bit of allow you to give a little bit of an overview of your biography as well as your the theology. So uh, maybe we can begin, Norman, by having you talk just a little bit about uh, growing up in Chicago, some of the influences uh, on your early life. Yes. Uh, I grew up in the Woodlawn area of Chicago, close to the University of Chicago. But uh, my main contact with the university was to join a, a bunch of buddies who would go over and walk around the ledges of the, of the buildings until somebody would chase us. So at that time, uh, I, was, I was not very uh, academic, shall we say. Uh, the movement to uh, Southern California was primarily due, I think, to my mother wanting to leave uh, a place where a divorce had occurred and she just wanted another kind of start. So we ended up in Ontario, uh, which actually had orange groves in those days. It was surrounded by orange groves. I went back and none of, none of them are there. It's housing developments. Ontario just runs on into Pomona and that's it. Anyway, I guess I should say that during all this period, I had no contact with the church. Uh, though my father was Lutheran and my mother Baptist, uh, they were unchurched. They were non-goers, non-attenders. So my first experience was uh, in high school in Ontario. And I have to confess that the main reason I went to that church was to socialize, <laughs> to meet some people. Uh, that's, that's not a bad uh, incentive for joining a, a religious community. But it was a, a great opportunity. It was an evangelical church, non-fundamentalist. Uh, there indeed are such. And I had never heard of uh, the infallibility of scripture in my Ontario church. I had to go east to a seminary to hear about fundamentalism. So talk a little bit about your uh, time at Eastern uh, Seminary. Um... What, what led you to go to seminary in the first place? Uh, I went to Eastern because uh, the pastor in uh, Ontario was a graduate, and I didn't know much about anything. I probably didn't even know the names of most of the other Baptist seminaries, but I knew if he went there, it was going to be okay. And it turned out to be okay. Uh, Eastern Seminary was just coming out of its fundamentalist phase. It had been... Uh, established to counter Crozer Seminary as, as, as its liberal counterpart. But uh, by the time I got there, there may have been one fundamentalist left on the faculty. And uh, so I had some excellent teachers who introduced me into uh, history, uh, literature, uh, philosophy. And I should say this was a pre-seminary course uh, so that actually I have a BA from an uncertified institution though it now is certified. <laughs> I owe a lot of my uh, thinking, especially about ethics, from this experience. My teacher was Cubby Rutenberg, who was a living example 
of uh, a social conscience. And uh, he, he, he would, in class, he would adopt the position of, of an ethicist, and we would come at him and try to, to knock over his thoughts. But he was pretty skillful. He, he responded as, as, as those ethicists probably would have responded. So we had a good expo exposure uh, across the liberal arts, lots of language, uh, Hebrew, Greek, uh, tremendous. I wouldn't exchange it for anything. Now, Norman, this is uh, in the early post-World War II period that you're uh, doing your seminary there, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really from uh, the remnants of the Second World War. I had many, many jobs in high school that uh, military personnel once held. Uh, I uh, picked oranges, I pumped gas, I cleaned up chicken pens, I picked about every kind of fruit you can imagine. Uh, so yes, this was post-war. So you're probably not uh, too enamored with being paid in peaches, I would imagine, hey? Oh, peaches are fine. We didn't have peaches much. Uh, we had lots of grapes and lots of oranges and lots of lemons, but uh, peaches I still love. Bring them on. <laughs> now, you <laughs> you went on from uh, Eastern then to go to uh, do your, P, your doctoral work at Union. Do you <clears throat> want to say a word about that? Yes. Uh, once again, I didn't know much about where I should go. I was still kind of cloistered in the academic uh, communities. Uh, but one of my teachers strongly recommended that I go to Union Theological Seminary. Uh, he himself had not graduated from there, but he said, in the light of my talents and interests, that was the place to be. And so I went. Uh, they were a little suspicious of me at uh, Union because uh, Eastern had that fundamentalist tag still on it. So they had me write some papers. And I wrote a paper for Roger Shin uh, on ethical issues, got into Kierkegaard and others, and went to his office. And uh, he was pretty astonished at what was there. He had no problems with any of it. He asked me a few questions, and that was it. So I made my way successfully, uh, had uh, delightful quarrels with some of the professors. I remember John Knox uh, trying to address him. Norman, what made you decide to uh, concentrate uh, in Hebrew Bible? That's pretty easy to answer, I think, for two reasons. One, I had an exceptional string of teachers of Hebrew Bible, uh, every one of them outstanding, everyone different in style, but they were, they were wonderful. And then the second reason was that, to my mind, the Old Testament invites uh, every kind of method you can think of, perhaps short of mathematics and physics, and there are some folks who are even trying to get into that. Uh, there's always some point of contact between uh, the Hebrew Bible and other disciplines in the humanities and in the social sciences, and maybe even in psychology. So you, uh, you get your doctorate, and uh, where was your first position as a teacher? My first position was at Columbia University, just across the street from Union Seminary. Uh, the head of the department had uh, resigned, had moved on to another location, and they just needed somebody. And I, and I did a lot of paperwork and presiding at seminars. Didn't make any very big decisions, but uh, I was the head of the department for a couple of years until a, a new appointment was made. That was quite an honor for a, a young scholar. Now, your first, uh, your first text is, I believe I'm right, uh, it was an introduction to the Old Testament called A Light to the Nations. It uh, uh, was re reprinted in 1993 uh, by Wipfenstock. Uh, during the during the fifties, you're you're teaching Old Testament. Um, you're beginning to um, pay attention to what's happening around you in the world, um, and probably trying to figure out how you yourself, as a professor, could be a light to the nations. Um, what what kinds of issues first really got your attention? Social issues. <clears throat> 
As I recall, the first issue that really grabbed me was the question of nuclear disarmament. Uh, this was a period when uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. were stockpiling nuclear weapons, and uh, there were really moments there uh, when it seemed like maybe it was going to be a nuclear war. So uh, I actually hooked up with the campaign for nuclear disarmament uh, started by Bertrand Russell, I believe, and uh, there was a United States branch of that, and uh, I joined it, and that, and that was the beginning of my social justice career. Those of you who don't know CND, uh, it was a classic, in, in many ways, uh, one of the midwives of the modern peace movement uh, started in the United Kingdom. Um, one of the things that CND is perhaps most famous for is that it was the first group that popularized the peace symbol, yes. uh, which was constructed from semaphore language signs for N and D signifying nuclear disarmament. So tonight you learned where the peace symbol came from. Um, how, why do you think CND was, was so influential for you, um, particularly since it was uh, founded by an atheist? Well, uh, actually, I didn't know anything except that he was a philosopher, uh, that Bertrand Russell was, was a philosopher. And uh, I, I taught a lot of uh, apocalyptic literature in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, and some of it uh, looking to a... Uh, grand end to history, which would even be in a Holocaust of some sort. And a number of folks were taking that very literally. I didn't. But I could see right away that uh, we were in danger of doing something like that to ourselves. Well, this uh, really, your, your concern for disarmament really swung right into the early years of the peace movement in the 1960s. Uh, and <clears throat> During that time now, you were um, out on the West Coast. Where were you teaching in the West Coast, Norman? I was teaching at the uh, American Baptist Seminary of the West and at the Graduate Theological Union in uh, sort of two roles there. Uh, at, the, at, the graduate, at the Graduate Theological Union, uh, de dealing with advanced studies and at Baptist Seminary, uh, seminary level studies. It was a very attractive position, and I landed there just at the uh, time of the free speech movement. So 1963? Yeah. Or 64? Yeah, yeah. 64. 64. Uh, well, here's uh, Roland Bohr, uh, who I assume was a student of yours. He certainly has been one of your greatest uh, followers and fans and interpreters. Um, he uh, recently wrote a, uh, an article um, about your work, and in that article, he, uh, he says this, during the critical mass and urgency of the 1960s with free speech, Vietnam, nuclear issues, feminism, racial discrimination all coming together, with myriad groups forming and reforming and coalescing into popular fronts, with calls to speak truth to power, Marx as in Karl Marx, was in the air. So Gottwald read Marx, discovering, or perhaps it would be better to say rediscovering, the way that prophetic and Marxist critiques overlapped with one another. So this pipe-smoking, pock-faced seminary professor with shaggy hair and a serious look saw the connections with the Hebrew prophets. Uh, Since then, I've is that fair enough? <laughs> I've cashiered the pipe, and my hair isn't quite so shaggy. Well, do you think that's a, a fair description of uh, of you in the '60s? Uh, how would you like to uh, nuance that? No, I think I think it was a very fair uh, description. They, those were chaotic times. There were uh, suspicious folk on the faculty at the Baptist Seminary who thought I was uh, part of the stirring up of the trouble in the streets. In fact, I was accused of having overturned a car joined in overturning a car. Uh, the only problem with that accusation is that I was out of town at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's typical of the uh, polarization that occurred. We have polarization here, but that was polarization hyped up. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, during, during the late 1960s, um, 
you and Jack Elliott, who uh, couldn't be with us tonight, uh, and, and I think some others formed a study group called the Bay Area Studies in Theology and Related Disciplines, or BASTARDS, uh, as an acronym, uh, which you chose because you felt that as religious academics involved with the volatile social movements of the period, you felt like ill-begotten children. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the BASTARDS chapter. Uh, the BASTARDS chapter, uh, unaffiliated with any particular academic institution, uh, just began informally uh, as a few of us were talking about the possible implications of what we were experiencing for the things we studied. So uh, actually Jack, uh, who unfortunately can't be with us, as Chad has explained, uh, as Chad has explained, but uh, Jack and uh, Marvin Cheney and Chuck Brown and Ann Wire and occasional visits from Walter Wink and Howard Key when they were on sabbatical, uh, we went to work on actually starting with the Maccabean Wars, which, which were generally taught as religious wars. Well, religion was in there, but the politics and class struggle involved, simply amazing once we got into the detail. And then we moved on to other topics. Really, not every book of the Bible, but I think an example, a sample of just about every book or section and of the book can. How, how often did you meet? And did you meet in living rooms or pubs or where did you meet? We met in living rooms and uh, as I recall, we met uh, at least once a month, maybe twice a month. We had to keep our teaching going at the same time that we were engaged in this activity. Mm -hmm. Of course, all the people that you've named uh, went on to become very, very significant scholars in uh, in the field of political hermeneutics and social readings of the Bible. Um, some of you um, didn't settle for living room conversations, but you uh, uh, got further involved in, uh, in some of the local issues. And um, you, you all had a relationship, I think, with Berkeley Free Church. Uh, and out of that church came uh, a journal which flourished between 19... 73 and 1981 called Radical Religion. And uh, that's, that's where I first encountered your work and the work of others was uh, seeing the uh, rather funky um, production quality of uh, Radical Religion uh, generated out of somebody's basement, I think, um, during that period. What can you tell us about uh, Radical Religion? Because most people on this uh, Call will probably never have heard of it. Well, radical religion uh, had its birth, its birth at many other uh, phenomena at that time. In, informally, actually, it was going. I'm not sure of the uh, exact details of it starting when I joined. Uh, there, there were a group of graduate students mainly, and uh, it was entirely volunteer labor on top of all the studies that uh, they were engaged in. And uh, it, was, it was on a shoestring budget. We really survived from issue to issue on the basis of uh, subscriptions that we could manage uh, to, to retain. And we had chosen the title Radical Religion because, uh, as I understand it, as I recall now, it was the title of a, a journal that uh, Reinhold Niebuhr either founded or was involved in, and it expired, and we decided we'd bring it back to life. Now, there's, a, there's an irony here, um, but before we get to the irony, uh, radical religion really was interested in um, sort of the full spectrum of theological studies, church history, biblical studies, theology, ethics, from, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, social change movements, uh, sort of radical uh, analysis. Um, there, there were some really seminal pieces that uh, appeared in, in radical re religion, wouldn't you say? Well, I would say so. Uh, actually, the uh, overlap between radical religion and uh, Bastard was very close. We published articles uh, of Jack and uh, Jock Brown and uh, Marvin Cheney and perhaps some of the others. And I actually believe that the, uh, well, I'm certain about the two books, The Home, Home for the Homeless from Jack and tribes from me. It was being generated 
in that conversation that we were having. Not that we directly talked about it, but it was being generated, the methodology to use, what to look for, examples from the social sciences. It was all there. So uh, that was the seedbed of many things we were doing. Norman, were you uh, on the Radical Religion Collective long enough uh, to also be part of the struggle to save Maggie's farm? Oh, up yes. On Holy Hill? Yes, yes. That was a building that had served uh, many informal and some formal groups of the Graduate Theological Union, an old building, and it was going to be torn down uh, for a library. A library which has turned out to be perhaps the main value. <laughs> in my opinion, of the Graduate Theological Union, a tremendously good theological library. But uh, we, we just thought it could be built uh, in a way that wouldn't destroy Maggie's farm or many of his men. Maybe we were naive, but we did try. And of course, the great irony is that today, the only place you can find copies, archived copies of radical religion is at the GTU, GTU library that now inhabits the former site of Maggie's farm. So uh, that's, uh, that's how it goes, I guess. Yes, yes. Now, um, talk a little bit about um, a pretty momentous move for you, which was um, your move back from the West Coast to the East Coast. What were the circumstances of your departure, and uh, where, did you, uh, where did you land? Well, the circumstances of my departure is that, uh, that it, basically I was driven out of the Baptist seminary. Uh, they couldn't find anything <laughs> to blame me with. There were no complaints from students. Uh, so they pled uh, uh, insufficient budget and uh, they rigged it so there were a couple other faculty that went out with me. And uh, that threw me into a situation where I had only the position at the Graduate Theological Union. So I did a lot of uh, teaching roundabout in University of the Pacific, uh, uh, Cal State at uh, Chico, uh, you name it, I probably was there. Uh, it was a time when it wasn't easy for a white professor of anything, especially the Bible, to get a position. It was a time when Afro-Americans and women were being privileged in those positions. That, that issue that goes on about again and again about uh, affirmative action, affirmative employment and so on. So uh, I understand, I wasn't in on the conversation, but I understand that Bill Weber of New York Theological Seminary was, was talking with uh, Robert McAfee Brown saying, you know, we need, a, we need a new, an, another Old Testament scholar because Tom Boomershine is going to Dayton. And uh, wise, uh, that wise fellow, Robert McAfee Brown said, well, uh, you, you ought to give Norman Gottwald the call. I think he would be perfect. So uh, I went really as a kind of a tentative move, uh, New York Theological Seminary, not union, not general, uh, is a seminary that serves greater New York primarily, Afro-American, uh, Korean, uh, women, you name any of the minority groups, uh, and they were well represented at New York Theological Seminary. And a tremendous theological mix. Uh, at one point, we had 30 different denominations represented. I think probably 10 of them were some form of Pentecostals. But at any rate, we, uh, we really touched the church life of the metropolitan area. And that was a, a kind of a, a, that was a chance to test my ideas, my theses, because uh, Tribes of Yahweh was coming out about the same time. And when I presented this argument, it was very much accepted. These churches at the moment were operating on budgets that had been uh, devastated by the city and the state. And uh, they were in effect uh, social service agencies in many cases. And when I talked about uh, oppression and uh, class warfare, that, that was something they knew about. And uh, just, just one example, uh, one of my students was asked at his church to uh, teach a uh, 
Sunday school class of junior highs who were out of hand. He, he, he didn't know how to deal with them. Uh, so I talked to him about it and I said, uh, eh, see what they'll do with uh, some of my arguments in Tribes of Yahweh. Apply it to some of the texts. And he did and they loved it. They loved it. They, they were looking for an intellectual challenge without exactly knowing it. Yeah, I, I know you um, You feel that uh, New York Theological Seminary uh, benefited you as much as you benefited uh, the faculty there. It was a big influence on your on your career, wasn't it? Absolutely, because uh, heretofore I'd only uh, uh, heard about minorities, read about minorities, knew a few people who were in those categories, uh, had some mm -hmm. contact with minorities at G GTU, but those were rather intellectual, primarily intellectual. The experience at New York Theological Seminary was intellectual and cultural at the same time. You, 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 you had, for instance, you had to learn about Afro-American culture while not being an Afro-American. That was a great challenge. And uh, I learned an immense number of things in that experience. I want to come back to um, this book, which um, <clears throat> had an interesting genealogy. It was first uh, published um, by the Radical Religion Collective. Uh, and uh, I uh, was going through my files preparing for this webinar, and I found an original copy of, of uh, this reader, the Radical Religion reader, on uh, class origins and class readings of the Bible. Uh, as you can see, the format was sort of uh, spiral-bound, um, Xerox copied. This is how things circulated. It was then um, published um, by Orbis Books in 1983 as an anthology. It had come out in 1976 uh, as the Radical Religion uh, Reader. And then in 1993, uh, ten years later, it was republished by Orbis, co-edited and expanded um, by yourself and Richard Horsley. Uh, so again, you know, this book is is in some ways a tent under which um, the growing number of scholars who felt vocationally that your way of posing the problem of reading the Bible that was making sense to them. Um, did you feel like you were part of a movement, uh, a scholarly movement? Well, I. Felt like I was a part of something new, at least relatively new. I did. I wasn't taught any of this in seminaries, uh, but uh, I really felt it was significant, and I wasn't alone. You know, not only Jack, but a number of other, always a minority of scholars, and that's true to this day. Even though uh, social science methods are accepted widely in uh, academia. By no means, I would say, even a majority of biblical scholars uh, practice it or understand what they're doing. They will, they will give a social title to a book that really has very little to do with it. <laughs> but it, well, it's popular uh, enough to use, a, you know, to use it to traffic your work. Well, I can say that as someone who was a, a theology student, a Bible student at that time at the Graduate Theological Union, there was nobody, since you had left, uh, there was nobody on faculty um, who was teaching this kind of thing. And so books like this were sort of the lifeline uh, where we could learn the methodology and see what other people were doing. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it almost felt like an underground book um, being passed from hand to hand. Uh, and that, of course, brings us now to the main event, and we can't uh, put it off any longer. Um, let's talk about the Tri Yahweh, published in 1979, about the time you're moving east. Um, Frank Frick, who was uh, one of the deans of Old Testament studies at the time, wrote, it is difficult to overstate the significance of this work. It will undoubtedly set many agendas for many years to come. Well, um, that's pretty much turned out to be the case. It has reset the agenda for the entire field, but of course that took some time. Um, it was initially greeted with all the 
insular ambivalence that establishment biblical scholarship could muster. Uh, but that began to change. Um, can you tell us that for you, and this is a big ask because this is a thousand page book, can you tell us um, what for you were the main main ideas that make this book not only important but uh, as uh, has now been lab labeled a classic in the field? Well, I'd be glad to do that, but uh, I'd prefer to start with an incident that was uh, reported from South Africa. The uh, faculty of the religion department at the University of Cape Town was imprisoned for overnight or two or three days during the apartheid times. And uh, they were advised that they'd only bring in holy books. So uh, one of them brought in the tribes of Yahweh, which in that edition had the various symbols of the 12 tribes. And uh, the rather uninformed guard took a look at it. Is this a holy book? Oh, yes, it is a holy book. So it got in, and uh, the, <laughs> the, the inmates were reading it, were passing it from cell to cell and reading parts of it. And I actually had a Korean who at that time, under the harsh rule of uh, tyrants, I guess you could call them, was imprisoned, and he could only write to his brother or family. So he wrote to me in a letter to his brother in Washington, D.C., which was passed on to me, and I replied. And essentially what he said was, I didn't understand it the first time I read it, but in prison I began to understand it. Okay, you want some main points? <laughs> well, I think one of them you have well touched on, and that is it introduces social science methodology into biblical studies in a very radical way. And what's radical about it is that it applies those methods and illuminates early Israel in a controversial manner. And even to this day, there is no agreement about the origins. But uh, my view uh, is entertained by quite a few scholars, and it's considered one of the three classical views, if, if you will. So many people know about it. I imagine some people teach it who thinks it's who think it's crazy, but uh, that, that's uh, that's the case. And I should add, Norman, well, well, for, well, for for the sake of our audience, who uh, give us a thumb thumbnail sketch of each of those three classic um, hypotheses about the origins of early Israel. Well, yes, uh, I think my basis thesis about early Israel that it was a peasant movement, indigenous to Palestine. It's been long recognized that uh, the exodus cannot be demonstrated from any evidence whatsoever. And this was a way to begin thinking differently. I, I looked at the usual arguments that it was those people from Egypt and or it was nomads coming from Transjordan. And I said, neither of these works. I'm going to try another way. And uh, again, I started reading social science literature, one of the most important books I thought was Eric Wolf's book, uh, Peasant Wars of the 20th Century, uh, in which he described a process in the various uh, peasant wars of the 20th century that I found very close to what we find in the case of Israel. And this is classically uh, presented by an article of Marvin Cheney. Okay, so we got... Uh, we got social sciences into the movement, uh, in, into the biblical studies, and we posited that early, early Israel was a peasant movement indigenous to Palestine. This immediately cleared away all that speculation about an exodus. And uh, of course, that, in, that invited questions. Well, what was the exodus then? If, <laughs> as literature, what was the point, point, point of that? And uh, though I haven't dwelt on that a great deal, my answer to that is Canaan, Palestine, was controlled by the Egyptians at, at that time. And uh, they subjugated city-states there and would be definitely antagonistic to these peasants in the hills, even though they didn't have to bother with them too much because they were up there in the hills. Now, forget about them. 
So uh, this is a way of uh, presenting a root metaphor of the people. They escaped from the control of Egypt. They were under that control. They escaped from that control. And they developed their own religion, which remains a mystery in many ways, of course. Now, um, you, a couple of things uh, I want you to fill out for us a little bit because this is such an important paradigm, particularly for non-scholars to, to try to get. So your hypothesis is that uh, uh, when, we, when we think of the Israelite struggle with the Canaanites, we oftentimes think of that as uh, some kind of intertribal warfare or worse. Um, here are the Israelite outsiders coming in and conquering the indigenous people. You're, you're arguing that, in fact, all of Canaan was under the hegemony of Egypt. The Canaanite city-states, such as Jericho, uh, or for that matter, Jerusalem, uh, were centers of the projection of Egyptian power um, to control the um, indigenous peasants of the region. And the Israelites really were... Uh, a sort of a, a loose-knit confederation of all sorts of marginal people, possibly including a Moses group coming uh, coming from Egypt proper, as well as lots of other people. Say a little bit more about that. Who was early Israel? Well, uh, one way of putting it is that uh, quite a Canaanites in the hills were proto-Israelites. And quite a number of Israelites were ex-Canaanites. It was a process of growth of a new religion out of an old religion, stressing that the deity protected the community, fed the community, uh, defended the community, gave laws for the community. Uh, this was a way of constructing, as you say, a confederacy that uh, lacked a state, there, there, there was no uh, authoritative power, no executive power, no way of punishing anybody, except if one of the tribes or a few of the tribes thought that an infraction was serious enough, uh, they, would, they would deal with it. And the Song of Deborah actually talks about a number of tribes that didn't come to a war and sized. So, um... In fact, Israel, what you call this experiment in re-tribalization, this formation of a, of a non-monarchic tribal confederacy, um, isn't so much a, a, a new religion or a new politics as much as a return to um, pre-imperial life ways uh, in which um, mutual aid and um, uh, mutual self-defense is being recovered uh, apart from the hegemony of Egypt. Yes, that, that's correct. And it's, uh, it's actually to say that the religion is inextricably bound up with the social phenomena and the political realities. And, and in my view, and this is another thesis, uh, in my view, that early birth of Israelite community and religion served it well through all its subsequent history down to the present. The Jews have figured out how to survive without a head of state. And that was the way they began. And when they had kings, they had a lot of trouble with the kings that they had. Would you, would you go so far as to say that uh, early Israel was uh, uh, sort of a proto-anarchist uh, syndicalist experiment, uh, to use modern terms? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think that uh, the Israel would fall into that uh, model that some anthropologists talk about, tribes without rulers, uh, a well-known phenomenon uh, to, to anthropologists. And uh, I think early Israel falls into that very, very, very clearly. And you went so far, so far, both in tribes and in subsequent research, to actually investigate some uh, uh, analogies in other cultures to these these sort of 
tribal um, can say? Yes, I did. I, uh, I did a close study of the Iroquois Indians of New York State who formed a, a commonwealth, so-called, uh, spread across New York State, giving mutual aid to one another, and constituting a decision-making process in council. Uh, with the, the five different tribes being represented, and uh, they would they didn't want to act until they had a consensus. Uh, so if one group couldn't quite get there, or there was questions about it, they would throw it across the fire, which meant to another group to work on it. And uh, it's widely thought that this was one factor uh, in, in the way. Uh, the new nation developed its uh, constitution. Benjamin Franklin, I think, particularly, uh, had a contact. The other uh, group that I studied was the original settlers of Iceland, who came out of Norway when Iceland was virtually uninhabited. There were a few monasteries there. A, a terrible place to do anything, very cold, poor soil. <laughs> They really, they basically survived, I think, on fishing. But uh, they had about a 200 year period of oral history. And in that period, uh, they met periodically. Actually, I think it was every three years and held a council of all, all of Iceland, which was divided into four sections and had local autonomy and recited the law. Now, what that law was, I'm not certain. They brought from Norway something they worked on, something that met the need of where they were, and they had a law speaker. And we have a long list of the names of who were the law speakers year by year. And the law speaker would speak the law, and he would have a panel, so to speak, behind him. If he faltered, if he forgot something, if they think he didn't put it quite right, they would step in and uh, correct the, the oral uh, uh, version. And they got along with this for 200 years. And the memory of much of that was passed along because it got written down when Iceland was Christianized after a couple hundred years. And the Christian converts, the Icelandic converts to Christianity, wrote this stuff down and saved it. It was actually a much more temperate kind of Christianity than came to many other parts of Europe. Uh, so both of the, I take those two examples of two different ways in which a group lacking a head of state was able to form a working confederation. There circulates or once circulated the notion that early Israel was like the Amphictyony of Greece. But that disappeared. That didn't hold up. But nobody did anything further with it. Acting as though the, that's the only kind of confederacy that ever existed. In that case, around the temple of uh, Apollo at Delphi in Greece. Uh, so I think I demonstrated to my satisfaction that Israel could ha have had a very quirky kind of uh, non-government and as you say, uh, actually, one, there is one writer who called it regulated anarchy. They were they so, self um, Now, um, tribes, of course, has had huge influence, um, not only in the scholarly guild, um, but well beyond. And I know you want to um, uh, come back. You started with the story of people using the book in jail, people who are already working on uh, revolutionary uh, ideas. Uh, in 2002, uh, again, Roland Bohr um, wrote a book just on the impact of tracking the tribes of Yahweh um, on the tribes uh, um, it, um, it won a grudging respect, so much so that um, um, you, you journeyed from being a little bit of a uh, outcast, um, uh, literally in the case of Berkeley, but uh, 
sort of on the margins of the guild to uh, being asked to be president of the Society for Biblical Literature in 1992. Uh, so this book has endured, but not only convinced other scholars, um, but it also had a, quite a following among lay people who worked through a thousand pages of heavily jargoned uh, uh, writing because they were so hungry for this new perspective. Uh, I've been particularly pleasing to you uh, and that that's happened not only in North America but all around the world. Yes, that's true. Uh, it, the book was dressed as two experts in Hebrew Bible studies. Uh, not to a lay audience, not even to a church audience. It was addressed to what I thought were the incorrect paradigms being followed in biblical scholarship. So it's a pretty heavy book, admittedly, a pretty heavy book. And it astonished me how many people outside of academia even, in the church and outside the church, were reading this book thing about it, what it had to say. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been invited to many places, Korea, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, South Africa, Switzerland, England, <laughs> uh, to talk to talk book, uh, and particularly the social science methods that inform it. Uh, of course, that's, uh, you, you went on to um, sort of in this thesis, and you did what what we, we always need um, Hebrew Bible to do, which which is to give the the broad introduction. Uh, this is a book that came in 1985, the Hebrew Bible Associate Literary Introduction. It was reissued in yet an even briefer. Um, version in 2009, the Hebrew Bible. So you've been working hard to, to, to get these perspectives out broadly to, uh, to not only the academy, but to churches and, and educated lay audiences. Um, if, if, uh, if I'm on the webinar tonight and I'm thinking, man, I need to bone up on the Hebrew Bible, I need a good, readable introduction to the Hebrew Bible. Why would you recommend one of two books to this audience? Because they were exactly what they were looking for, a, no, a, knowledge, a knowledge of the significance, what the happenings and basic significance of uh, ancient Israel. And they would get uh, an interesting blending of literary methods with sociological methods. Uh, that have tended to go their own way, but I can see connection, connecting points don't totally merge in any way. They even don't quite overlap, but they've been very close so that careful study of the literature will suggest a social point, and a careful study of the social studies will say, hey, you know, why did they think this way? They were a kind of society but uh, why did they write this kind of literature in this genre, this, this poetry, whatever? And uh, for folks who want to uh, go deeper into your original thesis, um, you published this book, The Politics of Ancient Israel, which uh, pr provides a lot more depth on some of the issues that you've just been talking about in shorthand. Yes. Uh, actually, the uh, abbreviated... Uh, form of a socio-literary introduction, I would recommend. Uh, and I would also recommend The Politics of Ancient Israel, my mo most recent book. And uh, there are a couple things about this that are important. One is that the politics specifically of ancient Israel had not been studied very much and still have not been studied very much. They are being picked up, especially in Israel. Uh, and there are a good many uh, Jewish contributions now to this. But when I wrote polit political thought, political uh, science, political theory, none of it much applied to the Hebrew Bible. I applied it and I think made a, a, a pretty good contribution. And I think I come out pretty close to latest book of mine.
Michael Walter, who writes on uh, in the in the shadow of God, something like it, in God's shadow. Uh, and basically, we're both saying, we never figured out a government that would accord with its religion. It never did. And so Judaism has no politics. Mm. All right. I, I, I want to. Yeah, no allegiance wanna, to a particular form of politics. Go ahead. I want to point out that O'Brien of the Alternative Seminary in Philadelphia is has chatted uh, that at least one other introduction to the Old Testament is directly inspired by your norm, and that is Anthony Soresco's introduction to the Old Testament perspective from 2001. It's also a, a really nice um, way of getting at some of these ideas. I had a chance to meet uh, Tony uh, in the 1990s, and uh, he, he did, I think, a, a nice popular of, of your work. I want to tell our audience that we want to get uh, to the space for your questions and comments, so be thinking of what you want to ask them. Um, norms of publications, um, in 1991, you co-published a little manifesto critiquing capitalism along with four other prominent theologians, Gregory Baum, Beverly Harrison, uh, Dorothea So, and William Tabb. Um, so obviously this concern for economic justice, um, you continued uh, not only in your scholarly work, but also you retired from teaching in uh, 1995. Um, and since that retirement, you've had a lot more to work with. And I want to talk about a couple of things that um, you've you've uh, is the Democratic Socialists of America, um, and by the way, the the DA has the best Facebook page around, which is these very pithy um, and um, uh, pithy social analysis you can see here. Do um, you want to say anything about your, your work with, with the Democratic Socialists, uh, just as part of your own politics? I've, uh, I've been a member, uh, sometimes more active than other times. I've followed some of the projects uh, that they're engaged in. And uh, the organization is really trying to where it fits in. That it does not want to be a tag on to the Democratic Party or the Charian Party but it wants to make contributions that could have influence on the existing parties and maybe someday have a revival party in this, but that's not happening uh, right now. Uh, was there another part to that question? I think there was. Yes, he is. Uh, and there is a working group uh, on religion socialism, at least in the New York chapter, but I think uh, kind of drift with its former head chair not, not being able to guide longer. We're, we're beginning to talk about what is the thing could be done on the West Coast. Uh, the God and Capitalism work, a prophetic critique of market economy, uh, really, I would almost say happened by accident. That's not quite right. It did not happen through the purpose and any of us who's been there because we all invited as members to a foundation endowed series of lectures in Madison, Wisconsin. And so we each brought something more or less on that theme and it was how we did and so that all the manuscripts, hey, this is published. But, uh, not much has been done, but that might be a work that Whipsman Stock could uh, reprint. 
Yes, it, yeah, I had I had to be uh, uh, twist. My arm twisted is too strong. I had to finally capitulate the excellent description of those events that, that Chad and Elaine presented <clears throat> to me. I was really happy to be at Tucson, and I leapt at the chance to be at Rochester. The others, uh, I haven't, I hadn't been able to. Yeah, the vision was, given that uh, we strongly felt that biblical studies should inform social movements, we asked, what can we do? What, as Scott, what is distinctive that we can do? And we began to say, what's going to happen to our libraries? Some of, <laughs> some of our colleagues pulled them off. They were scattered. Some of them gave them to a certain educational institution. A lot of them had thought about what they're going to do with their books we, we've discovered when we talk to them but we're getting people interested and i would say we have somewhere near eight thousand volumes maybe at this point and including an offer from the retiring the fellowship of recognition uh to give us four thousand of his books and that's really important 
faith and justice and between the Bible and just. Now, Norman, the, the question coming in, and Charlita and Tim are um, uh, frantically fielding them. Will O'Brien uh, wants to ask the question that I'm sure is on a, a lot of the folks' mind tonight. Um, basis on the origins of Israel um, really is a paradigm. How do you think it our understanding of Jesus' ministry? question, but I'm sure you've been asked this before. And would you go so far as to say that Jesus read of the kingship of God, or what we call the kingdom of God, um, may have um, memory of radical confederacy prior to the rise of the monarchy? Now, um, <clears throat> one of our listeners, Kyle, uh, heard somewhere that the, the word he Hebrew, or perhaps he's referring to the uh, term apiru, originally meant troublemaker or revolutionary. Do we know the true etymology of the word? <laughs> right, a.k.a. the Catholic workers. That's right. Um, Norman, um, Jim Jones wants to uh, know, he says the Passover is such a central liberation event, the literature, central to the faith, the living faith of Israel and Judaism. Do you think there's any historical basis for something like the Passover as it's narrated in Exodus? Um, go ahead. <clears throat> 
Um, Ted Lewis, who uh, works with Whip and Stock and is on our webinar, I think, for the first because. time. I'm welcome, Ted. Uh, has a question for you. He says, thanks, Norman, for your great work. To what extent does the Hebrew prophet's critique of idolatry contain accurate socio-scientific analysis that might be relevant to contemporary critiques uh, of idolatry um, versus the straw man critique. If I understand what Ted is saying, uh, usually we think idols are something that pagans put up, um, whereas actually the prophetic critique of idolatry has a lot to do with um, uh, what Marx called commodity fetishism, that is the human tendency to things and then place higher value on things than on people. Uh, and you see an ongoing relevance for this prophetic critique of uh, of idolatry. Definitely so, and uh, a good example of the departures that various interpreters take from this is uh, Norman Padora's study of, which is quite respectable intellectually, ends uh, by saying that idolatry is all these uh, minority movements, feminism, and student. Uh, uprisings and so forth. That's the problem. Those are the idolatrous things. Others identify what you identify, Chad. And there are a couple of uh, scholars who have uh, this point. I would say that uh, there exists a series of lectures uh, uh, of essays that were also given as lectures by Ben Cheney of San Francisco Theological Seminary that show the references to idolatry and the are actually references to social dental misbehavior. Uh, the problem with Marvin is perfectionist about his writing. So if any of the stuff, they exist as scattered essays, uh, and give them a push, try it. But uh, some of the <laughs> I tried very hard to get his stuff Thanks, Norman. If David is uh, standing by, then we've just lost your video. Uh, the and problem with see Marvin if Norman, is, uh, if David can uh, get your video. So if any of In the you meantime, stuff, um, keep yeah, listening um, because your, uh, and your want to answer give push, um, it, flows but, into uh, a question from. Uh, I tried very hard to get stuff out. Based on your understanding of people's movements in both uh, scripture and in history. There exists. What mobilizing lectures, strategies uh, uh, do you see as most effective as lectures in the faith Marvin Cheney, the crisis theological seminary, uh, and that corporate influence on the government? To idolatry uh, and prophets are George Armstrong to social adds to that. Um, uh, the what about the whistleblower phenomenon recently, about his writing. particularly around the issue of so surveillance? Of so stuff, a lot of people there, they exist as wanting space. to know what you think uh, some of the current events. And when you give events. them a push, try it. But, uh, some of the I tried very hard to get his stuff out. But, uh, there exists a series of lectures uh, of essays that also given as lectures by Marvin e. of San Francisco Theological Seminary that show how the reference to idolatry and the prophets are actually references to social misbehavior. Uh, the problem is. He's a perfectionist about his writing. So if any of you read his stuff, they exist as scattered essays uh, and want to try it. But some of the I <laughs> tried very hard to get his stuff out. But, uh, exists a series of lectures uh, of essays that were also given as lectures by Marvin Cheney of San Francisco Theological Seminary that how the references to idolatry and the prophets are actually references to social misbehavior. What what contemporary social uh, movements the problem with give Marvin you is hope? He's a perfectionist about his writing. So if any of you read his stuff, there are scattered essays, uh, and want to give a push, try it. But uh, some of the <laughs> I tried very hard to get him out. Uh, there exists a series of lectures uh, uh, of essays that were also given as lectures 
by Marvin Cheney of San Francisco Theological Seminary that show how the references to idolatry and the prophets are actually references to social misbehavior. Uh, the problem with Marvin is he's a perfectionist about his writing. So if any of you read his stuff, they exist as better essays uh, and want to give him a push, try it. But uh, some of the I <laughs> tried very hard to get his stuff out. <clears throat> but, uh, there exists a series of lectures uh, uh, of essays that were also given as lectures by Marvin Cheney of San Francisco Theological Seminary that show how the references to idolatry and the prophets are actually references to social misbehavior. Uh, the problem with Marvin is he's a perfectionist about his writing. So if any of you read his stuff, there they exist as scattered essays uh, and want to give him a push, try it. But uh, some of the I <laughs> tried very hard right. to or, get his stuff out. Or as the Israelites might have said back in the day, there's no government like no government. Um, Norman, I want uh, to ask you one more question before we uh, let you go, because we've really put you through a workout here tonight. Um, we're so very, very grateful for you coming on and talking with us uh, about your life and about your work. And I want to say to the audience, um, read Norman Gottwald's work uh, in whatever form you can find it. It's dense. It's um, not simplistic. But it continues to be hugely important. And uh, it is a great treasure uh, to both the churches and to social movements. Norman, we got a mix on uh, online here. There's actually a number of names I'm not familiar with, which is always a good sign. Um, oh, I'm but, happy. Uh, to we've got about 30 on, uh, people join us uh, tonight. Snowden, their pastors, uh, a, their a, activists, a poll of their. Um, Late Citizens folk, in the United um, States show deeply that involved, 50 some percent uh, in all sorts think of he's issues. a whistleblower uh, and not a traitor. Many of them are young. So that's telling you something. Um, uh, than you and and me. one person uh, and put it, it's not what would who be your let advice the information to out, folk it's this, what's uh, the content of the tonight. information. Why should they bother and, uh, to read someone the has argued that Why uh, should they commented that waste time more and more Torah people and the prophets have access to if these they're trying to change the world? The more the greater the chance that there, that more stuff is going to be spilled, and uh, it's rather it's it's rather disingenuous of Obama to say this is a discussion we ought to have, but we only have it because of Snowden, whom he's chasing to put in prison. There's an irony there, I would say. I think what gives me hope is various social movements that I read about in the papers. That a lot of them are not uh, very publicly known. I would say the resistance to the Palestinians is, re is a remarkable instance of a social movement. They will not be put down, and they will someday have their way. It's, it's going to be a painful process. Uh, but there are other countries where something like that is happening. A lot of popular movements, a lot of demonstrations. Have you noticed how many countries, Turkey, Egypt, et cetera, et cetera, are having these difficulties because of poor leadership, uh, domination, uh, infighting, all of this. And I, 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 I think that Someday they will. Now, Norman, have to you're, be much a, you're a churchgoer yourself. Do you want to <clears throat> give a shout out to your uh, First Baptist Church of Berkeley there? That represent the, this social movement. Uh, and I hope we can get there. We may learn something from other countries where there are such uh, movements a little stronger than they are here. But uh, the Bible doesn't contain any, any blueprint. I already said that the Israel, it's never figured out. <laughs> what the best form of government is. And the Christians never figured it out, even though they thought they did. The Pope knows. 
<laughs> Norman, um, when Tribes of Yahweh came out uh, more than 30 years ago now, Frank Frick wrote that it is difficult to overstate the significance of this work. It will set agendas. Well, he turned out to be prophetic, but I think it's fair to say that still now, almost 35 years later, it's still difficult to overstate the importance, not only of tribes of Yahweh, but of your work as a scholar, as a um, Baptist uh, conscience, um, as someone who de cares deeply about social movements and social change. We're very, very grateful for, uh, for your work and your witness and especially for coming on um, to be with us tonight and for the legacy that you are leaving for us in the Center and Library for the Bible and Social Justice. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. First, because uh, the Hebrew Bible contains a lot of uh, supportive uh, material, basic grounding in uh, social ethics. Well, that thank you for great passing on that ancient gift to yeah, us. But and you, may have we, to, uh, you have to winnow it through learn the whole it and Hebrew Bible. You've got to study it because it's full of good stuff it in our and time. full of trash, if I may so say So thank you, so. Norman. Uh, secondly, um, you need to study it because your friends, our next uh, webinar will be uh, right. in about a month. Study the Bible which, uh, and give time we're going to look at another historic legacy. This that. time, part of our own I, nation's I, history. I we're going to be looking at the 50th Deuteronomy anniversary 15, of the March which is on Washington. Again, the poor will um, always be with you. This is so part of our continuing it. webinar well, series they didn't read on the, whole passage the ways in which 1963 was the turning point civil rights movement. So what does and the we'll look at the mean? fascinating hidden history of this fa most famous raise march, up people especially the role played by Bayard Rustin, who's people, pictured so some here who always will. to the right of King with the glasses on. But they're not supposed um, to stay we'll in the We'll be joined land. by two guests. To help them. One is uh, the aforementioned so, uh, Osegefu Seku I think those are the two main from Boston, the positive he's a long-time activist, pastor, it, and theologian, and, the negative. and he's the, going to the, talk the, about uh, how we can undomesticate Dr. King's most famous moment and sound bite. And also uh, Tobias Pinckney, who's a professor of law at Medgar Evers University in Brooklyn, who's going to be oh, a yeah, we, uh, uh, we want to thank I everybody for their the participation band. tonight and remind you that Baptist, this, First Baptist Church uh, this and, uh, webinar will be available in archive out, form. Uh, it's what, one of the nice things about we, these we, conversations is that we now have them for park. posterity, and, uh, and what are we, uh, do we about hope that? you'll share we them with your friends. That's another way that you can introduce Mormon's work to them. Uh, that should be up a in, uh, in a few days, and we will email you. It's from let you know when it is up. We hope we see we you, ask you how can uh, we next month it? on the webinar. First of all, and we hope that all of you will help us spread news. Uh, we don't have don't a big advertising uh, apparatus. We rely on word of mouth. Because they don't have an uh, we've had people on uh, three or four different That's continents tonight. Um, some folks from uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia. <clears throat> uh, we're so delighted that you joined us. Thanks so much, and we're gonna lead you out with uh, more music from Pat Metheny if you want to chat to each other. Uh, thanks again for joining us. See you next time. Thank you again. Thank you, Norman. <clears throat>